Hey guys, it's Bradley. Uh, I'm still trying to perfect this uh, video introduction to simplices. So this is like take two and a half, so bear with me. Um, this time I went ahead and, and wrote out the table before uh, recording. So anyway, uh, the simplices are a class of shapes that are very important to my work. Um, I didn't come up with the term. It's like a pre-existing mathematical term, but um, I find them to be uh, central or fundamental in um, pretty much every model of anything I ever make, <laughs> uh, and, and also kind of intrinsic to the structure of space itself and space-time. Um, so I won't really go too much into applying it, though this is really just an introduction. So um, I'll begin by showing you just what the simplices are. Get, you can get a feel for it. Um, so we're looking at this column here, and uh, I'll comment on the numbering in a second. But um, so the zero simplex, uh, simplex of zero dimensions, is a point. Uh, the same thing is true for the one-dimensional simplex. Two-dimensional simplex is a line segment. Three-dimensional simplex is a triangle. And a four-dimensional simplex is a tetrahedron. Looks like this. Uh, four-sided pyramid. Um, so you don't really get a flavor for what what is the shape like, what does it feel like, what differentiates it, uh, until you get all the way up till to, to three, which is um, kind of telling. Uh, I mean, it, <laughs> it's it's no mistake that that we've been stuck on duality for a really long time and uh, not seeing what what goes next afterwards. Um, so anyway, so it's basically it's an infinite series of shapes, um, or you could just think of it as one shape with a different um, like incarnation for every dimensionality. Um, so it's it's very similar to the way you have like a line segment and a cube. I mean, a line segment and a square and a cube and a tesseract, or a circle and a sphere and a hypersphere. It's very much like that. And these, if you had to uh, describe them kind of in, in a general flavor sort of sense, these are the triangular ones. These are the ones that are uh, pointy. Um, these are the ones that are the simplest possible shape that can exist in a given dimensionality, uh, which is um, my understanding of where the name comes from. So, um, like if you, if we're talking flat and, uh, you know, two dimensions and um, a triangle is the, the least complicated thing that could exist there without being degenerate. So you could still have a line segment on a, a flat thing like a page, um, but that would not express the full the fullness of the dimensionality available, the full two-dimensionality there. Um, and it's simplest, it's um, got three vertices or points, three sides, and uh, three spindles, which is this next row that I'll get to. Um, so the, the, those, those three numbers are always the same um, for all the, the simplicities. And um, Uh, so, so yeah, I, I told you I was going to make a note about the uh, numbering, which is to say that um, although I didn't come up with the concept, I did modify the numbering to be reflective of this um, characteristic number that I just pointed out. So two points, two spindles. Um, the two sides is harder to see with that one. But um, basically... Uh, so, so, all I'm really trying to say is that although I, I just described this as two-dimensional, that's kind of for y'all's benefit. Like, I, I think of this as three-dimensional. Um, I think of uh, simplicial dimensions as the default dim kind of dimensions. And um, I'll sometimes say simplicial dimensions to contrast it with... Um, with Euclidean or Cartesian dimensions, which are 
uh, you know, the traditional dimensions where you have like a positive and a negative in each, in each dimension. Um, so this is a different kind of, of way of describing dimensions, uh, especially when you get to the spindles. So these are called spindles. Um, they're basically the axes of each uh, simplex, although I, I tend to think of them as just axes describing spaces, uh, so infinite, you know, little arrows at the ends of them. Um, but they're just, basically, you, you put a, a point at the center of a simplex and you draw rays out through the vertices, and that's how you make a spindle. Um, real straightforward. Um, I, I call the whole thing a spindle, but I also call each one a spindle. So a two spindle has two spindles. Three spindle has three spindles, and so on. Um, an important point about the spindles is that they are... The, 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 the spindles that form a spindle are always um, separated maximally from each other as they repulse. So like spread through the entirety of the space. So it's kind of hard to, I mean, it's easy to see here. I'm at least trying to make it so that all of those internal angles are 120 degrees. So it fills the, you know, 360 degree threeness, which is my way of saying two dimensionality. Um, and, uh, and and that's that's like canonical for me. Um, even if I were trying to describe a um, a non-regular simplex, a simplex where not all of its sides or angles were the same, I would still plop it onto a regular spindle. Um, so so this is supposed to be three dimensional. I'm not sure how effective that image is, but you can imagine it. Um, you can also see maybe what I mean looking at the inside of this. This is a what I call a spindled simplex, which is um, just a simplex with the part of the spindle that uh, that fits in it. In it, <laughs> so instead of an infinite spindle, just this bit, this much. Um, so let's see. Um, I want to mention uh, a couple of things about what attracted me to these shapes, but without being exhaustive. Like I said, this isn't really an applications video. Um, but originally I was thinking of uh, the simplices as the ideal way to model cotomies, which is my term for just a, a dichotomy, but generalized to however many objects. Um, so I usually think of the elements of the objects as being the vertices, which I commonly call points as well. Um, so this is like a, represents a trichotomous relationship. Um, and what is so cool about simplices, one of many things that's so cool about simplices, but kind of, uh, the, the one that really pops out at you is, uh, the, rec the recognition that no matter how many elements are in your simplex, and no matter how big it is, um, there is an edge that connects every single pair of vertices that form it. Um, so I'll just demonstrate on the four simplex. It's the biggest one I have right now. So, um, so this vertex up top, there's an edge going to each of the other three, and that's true of, of every vertex in it. Um, so, and because this is a regular simplex, uh, that means that the sides and angles are all equal. Um, that, that implies that it's an equal distance to, from one point to all of its neighbors. Um, but that is true even if you have a million elements in a simplex. Um, even if you have a million dimensional structure, um, it's still true that every single one of the elements in it has access via the same uh, standard side length to 
all 999,999 other elements. Um, so it's kind of like RAM, random access memory, um, which is, you know, the concept of no matter where, what address you're going to, it takes the same amount of time to get there. It's, it's very analogous to that. Um, so I think that's all I'll say for that at the moment. I wanted to mention another thing about the spindles too, which is that, um, one thing that surprised me, but really kind of hammers home just how kind of essential or built into reality, uh, simplicial relationships are, is that, um, a spindle, the way that it's spread out, um, it, it spreads to fill the entire space, uh, as I mentioned, the, the entire dimensionality. Um, space I use loosely as just any kind of dimensional, you know. Um, so it's spread like this, but then even if you add another dimension, even if you increase the dimensionality, there you don't get any better or more efficient or um, more spread out way of uh, of representing it. So, I mean, if I take this off the page, I could kind of mess, you know, toy with it and spin it around and stuff. Um, but there's no way that I could increase the separation and the equalness and the, the distribution of those spindles um, no matter how many dimensions I add. Um, so it's these internal angles or uh, axes or spindles are very, I, I often think of them as the characteristic, the defining characteristic of um, a relationship. So um, this is the as I said, it could be a model of a trichotomy, um, but really what shows the relationship between the elements of the tri trichotomy is not so much this as this. This is like a surface level thing, but this shows the internal structure and also that immutable uh, kind of spread. So, um, so after that, I just want to go through my models for uh, trying to figure out what a, a five simplex is. So, um, I already named, so this is triangle, this is tetrahedron. Well, a five simplex is called a pentacoron. Um, so it is in traditional numbering, four dimensional, uh, structure, uh, that, that correlates with these others. So, um, it's bound by uh, five tetrahedra. So just like a three simplex is bound by three two simplices, a four simplex is bound by four three simplices, triangles. Um, a five simplex is bounded by five four simplices. So um, obviously it, it's, it's very hard to um, get from that idea to actually visualizing it or, you know, wrapping your head around it. So I've come up with a variety of ways. Um, I'll start with this simplest one. Um, I say simplest kind of because it's like most canonical. This is called a net. So a net in math is, or in ge geometry is, um, something that you can fold to form a higher dimensional structure. Um, so before I go back to that one, let me just, I'll just put in this space here. Oh, wrong pen. Uh, I'm just gonna draw out a, the net of a tetrahedron first. Gee, it's not a very good one, is it? I'll figure it out. Um, so this is just, just to give you the, the concept of a net uh, before I talk about the higher dimensional one, if this is helpful. So um, the idea is, and if I had drawn this better, it would work a little better, but um, 
So there's four triangles, and these are going to be the outside, the faces of the tetrahedron. So you fold along these three internal lines, you fold these three outer corners up into the center, and join them in at the top, and then that's that creates the structure. So you probably have heard of this, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So this is the net of a pentaquan. So you see within this structure are the five um, tetrahedra that will be the outside, the, the faces, the surfaces on the outside of the pentacoron. So um, there's four, if I hold, hold them with my fingers like this, there's four that I'm touching with my fingers, and then there's just one in the middle, so five. Um, so once again, you fold along the... Uh, the edges that are in the inside. In this case, the edges are planes. So you fold along these four planes and you fold these four points um, up to a higher dimensional fifth point, um, which of course we can't really uh, visualize. Um, so that's why I say this is kind of like an introductory uh, tool because it's 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 useful really for a higher dimensional being to create a, a pentacron, but it, it's not really kind of evocative or, or life bringing because it kind of requires this uh, external uh, being or intelligence or something to do the folding for us. Um, doesn't really give us any clues. Um, so the one that. I think is most uh, most quickly most simply addresses that uh, criticism is this. Um, so this is a bispindle tetrahedron. Uh, you can also see if you look the uh, five tetrahedra that will be the outside of the pentacoron. They are the whole one, the outer one, and then these. Uh, and here, and here, and here, and here. So, like the this short squat tetrahedra that are underneath the spindle, basically, or around the spindle. Um, so, in this one, what you do is basically just, oops, increase the length evenly of the spindles on the inside, and. Uh, the length, or you could think of it as pressurizing them, and um, just increase it, increase it, and until it'll explosively, spontaneously pop into the fifth dimension. Um, for me, that's a more evocative um, way to imagine it, although it still doesn't really get me to the end product, but it makes me think a lot more about the transition, you know, and how might that happen. Um, so, uh, the really good idea for this, or, I mean, really. The major improvement or benefit is that um, you don't need to know to what point you're folding. So with this, the the obstacle to our using it is that we can't visualize any fifth point that would be equidistant to these four points um, towards which we could fold them all. Um, so this eliminates that problem by basically saying just you know put in some put in some pressure put in some energy and have it spontaneously um as i said explosively pick the the direction for you you know you don't need to know which way it's gonna which way it's gonna go because you can't even wrap your head around which what options there are so um i'm gonna come back to this but i'm gonna move on now this next one um has a lot of significance for for what it models, but I'll leave that for another video. Um, so, and and I will say that um, this comes directly from my studying of the simplices as ways to model cotomies. So, um, what I realized with this one is that. You know, one thing that I know about the higher dimensional structure 
um, is that there will be a a point the, the new point will be of equal distance to uh, all of the four points we have now on the outside but also um, of that will be the same length as the existing side length so th this even though it's going to become uh, dimensionally larger it's it's not going to get I don't know would you say wider longer um, the, the side the side length between any two vertices will be the same so I just went ahead and and drew out um, from each vertex towards a new point which is uh, of the the right distance away that, that we can model in this space so um, so from here, you go out to here, from here, you go out to here, from here, you go out to here, and here, you go out to here. So each one is um, kind of, I, I say this comes from looking at them logically because um, if these are thought to be opposites in a Cotamus relationship, uh, tetrachotomy um, then the the distance the the the, the different yeah sorry the differentness um, between these opposed cotamus opposite things um, is it kind of of utmost importance and it's if you could come up with a model for a pentacoron which preserves that property um, you have the potential for it to be useful even as it is without growing in dimensionality without actually uh, being transformed um, so that was my thought so I just thought well you know where where in this space would we put it um, from the point of view of each of the vertices and then what if all those points were one point so um, why don't I do that out drawing it um, for you just like I did with the net um, so I'm gonna once again I'm gonna use the three simplex to kind of help get this idea across. I'm just eyeballing it once again. So here's your trichotomy. Um, I'm looking for a point that could be um, from this vertex of the same distance away as are these two. So I have this radius, this whole radius around it. Really, it could go in any direction, but the only kind of useful direction for it to go is towards where the other ones will be, more or less. Um, like I, if I just put them all going out here, that, that doesn't really teach us anything. It doesn't help us at all. Um, once again, that's kind of like a net <laughs> that you need to know where you're folding towards. Um, okay, so goes out to here, mark it, let's repeat that, not bad. So um, you can see pretty easily that if you could grab, if, you know, if these were toothpicks and you could grab the edge of them, you could just drag them up and together and make a point pretty easily. Um, I sometimes think of it as like twisting or rolling it. Like say, again, if there were toothpicks and you put a, um, like a, not a rubber band, um, like a bread tie and <laughs> like wound it up, you know, kind of corkscrewing them up together. Um, so that's the idea. Um, but I think to, 
I, what I've done here is not just leave them dangling, is I've connected them with a small tetrahedron. Um, I've connected them to each other as kind of uh, indicating that they are one point, that this is these these things are connected, these are a single structure, they're not four struts going to nowhere. Um, so then the way you make this one bloom is uh, shrinking the smaller tetrahedron in the middle. You know, so, you know, think of applying equal pressure or shrinkage or whatever on all four of these vertices of the small one in the middle, and um, then it'll kind of just bloom the pentacle on in place. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's that. Um, and I have one more model, which is the most challenging to describe, but yet somehow it's the most intuitive uh, to me. Um, and I'm not sure that I'll get it on the first try trying to describe it. But um, I'm go coming back to this one. Uh, but this time, I really don't care about the simplex. I'm just looking at the spindles. And... Um, I find that, in my mind, if I can imagine this spinning while also moving in some direction, um, like, and once again, this is, this is kind of a feel for it thing, it's not like a literal thing, but, um, so if I imagine it spinning, um, you know, e either kind of losing the leaves of the lower di dimensions as it goes, um, kind of unraveling, shuffing off the the other content. Um, but really, it's just about a spin, and it's very it's it's hard to describe. Um, but it's kind of like you, uh, like you're, you, you. It has to be accelerating. Um, sort of in a way that like it's kind of like your part of it is being held because okay i i'm apparently i'm not really you know up to explaining uh why this works um but it it's it, it's kind of feels relativistic it kind of feels like it has to do with the way that um the how time kind of ripples over the structure as it was moving accelerating but also spinning um and that kind of when i when i'm successful visualizing this it just uh it just kind of spins through a whole rotation all of its axes and then but by the time i know it i have another axis like like it, it just kind of like it slips in from behind kind of in the process of moving so um and once again that's really easier to visualize without the simplex around it so um hopefully that's helpful for you all um i mean i guess you don't know where i'm going with this but uh i hope some people watch it and uh learn from it and uh give me feedback i definitely need feedback i'm uh kind of having a tough time sometimes knowing whether I am just, uh, I, I could definitely use some help with my presentation skills and kind of knowing, you know, what I'm, what I'm going to say and uh, shit like that. So anybody with any sort of feedback, I'd welcome it. Um, thank you very much. My name is Brad, Bradley Gibbons. Good night.